to our cause session. We hope that everyone is well and we thank you so much for joining us. We're so uh, happy to have some very special guests today to look at various practices in uh, the UK. And I'd love, like to give the floor over to Alex Klein and thank him for all of his partnership. Alex, it's all yours. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. And it's a very special evening, afternoon or morning to everybody because we have a very dear friend of mine, Yehuda Marx, who's going to talk about his book in defense of Chazanus. And uh, Yehuda is a graduate of Jews College and a fully qualified um, Chazan. And he is the chief Chazan at Heaton Park Synagogue in Manchester. He was trained at Jews College by Leo Brill, and he has given lectures and talks on Chazanus at various um, places for us around at the ECA conventions and at Limud and uh, various different synagogues to great acclaim. He's in conversation with Nathan Goldman who I have known since the tender age of 11, when Yehuda and I first started to um, teach him about chazonas and about music. And he's a graduate of um, Tel Aviv Cantorian Institute and was be, has been trained by um, Yecheskel Klang, Naftali Herstic, Chaim Feifel, Raymond Goldstein, and has be, and graduated from the school mm -hmm. and did his army service. I can't hear any sound. Now, sorry? Can you not hear me? Hello? Yehuda, can you hear us? I can hear you. Could you not hear me? I can hear you, Alex. Thank you. Hey, it you seems the you issue seems to be you. with Yehuda's speaker. She's hearing everyone, but we can't. I can't hear anything. And Nathan is now the chief cantor of the Hebrew congregation in Stuttgart in Germany. So I'd like to hand it over to Nathan Goldman, who is going to introduce the program and speak to Yehuda. Thank you. I welcome. Uh, thank you, Alex. And to the uh, European Cancers Association and everyone involved. And I hope you can hear me all right. Um, of course, how could I? I'm, I'm so happy to say publicly um, my thanks to Alex Klein and to Yehuda Marx, who both uh, really uh, encouraged me as a young child to appreciate Chazonus and appreciate Davening and appreciate Nusuch and appreciate um, the formative of a, of a choir and uh, and and. I really owe everything to you, both of you. So it's very, I'm very happy to say publicly uh, my thank you to both of you on that, uh, on this Zoom. With regards to Hazen Marx, he really was, I was his Meshora from a very young age. Um, we sang together on Rosh Hashanah, we sang together on Pesach, we sang together very, we sang Yosela together, we sang beautiful pieces together, and he was a marvelous, he is a marvelous teacher. He had a lot of patience and a lot of, uh, he's going to pay me after, you know, he's going to pay me money after this, but <laughs> but he really was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, a wonderful person to me and a great encourager uh, to me. And I, this evening is about him and his book. And I want to say one thing before uh, we start, and I'm going to say it at the end as well is that here's the book. If you want a copy of this book, you have to email Yehuda Marks 
So that's Y-E-H-U-D-A Marks M-A-R-X 21 at gmail.com. And if you need that email address, again, you can speak to Alex or anybody from the European Cancer Association would have that address. And so I'm going to now address Yehuda. You can hear me. Can you hear me, Hazan Marks? I don't, excuse me, I'm going to, I don't think he hears you. I don't think he hears me either. Maybe I need to sing to him. He's muted anyway. Oh, he's muted. He is, after but I've, he can't, he can't hear after us. I've, after I've said all that nice stuff about him, but he's not going to hear us it, again. I, I have sent, I have sent Yehuda's phone number to Mark. Hopefully he can get through that way. Yes, nice. if anyone can call him, uh, I mean, we can check. This could be as simple as an audio uh, setting, um, but we need to be able to communicate with him. Do you want Let to me pause? try. Do you want to pause the recording? Oh, now we can say what we like. Uh, we are still to, live I'm on trying YouTube. To, <laughs> try to oh. phone. Can't Should pause we? that. Should we ask Yehuda to go back to his original computer because yes. I think that might work better. I really think this is an audio Hello? setting. Hi, Melanie, it's Alex. We can't... Hi, there's a problem. We can't hear anybody and I'm packing Yehuda's settings on his laptop and everything seems to be fine. Can you ask them ask if... Oh, uh, yeah, Yehuda's oh, yeah, picked... Yehuda's picked Oh, can you, can you speak, your please? please? Yes, I can. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear you, but can you hear us? Can you hear me? I can't see anyone, though. You can't see anybody. Can you can you hear anybody, your hood? Your settings are right on there. To be told that he, we were able to hear him just for a moment. Um, if if I can troubleshoot with him for a second, do we still have him on the phone? I took him off the phone because I thought we had the connection back, so I didn't want the phone to interfere. I think he should use Melanie's iPhone. Finished. You were better off using no, the I mean, I wanted to come over the shop and do this. It's fun. The one thing that we need to check is the audio settings because this wasn't a problem before. So there, there should be a logical explanation. Hello. Hi, I'm in the, I'm on the middle of a Zoom meeting. Okay, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I want you join us. It you heard Marks okay. and um, Nathan on defense of Kazonis. Um, yeah, you'll have to send me the link. Uh, um, it, if you go on to the uh, the website, Alex, you'll get it. Must go. Alex, you're on. you live on Zoom. Are you trying to help you, Huda? Yes, I was trying to, but I've I've come off. Melanie, I could phone Melanie again. Please do. We, 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 I, I, yeah. Hello. Hi, Melanie. It's, it's Hi. Alex. Um, Hi. I'm, with this, there's a, with all the settings on the, uh, new laptop are oh, fine. That seems mm -hmm. And now I'm fine, and I've checked them, so I'm going to set it up on my mobile it's to see if it's any now. better. It's working. It's a fault at all, it's all his. No, we are just hearing it through the phone. We can hear you. Well, we can hear him, but he can't hear us. Oh. Yeah, you can hear it through my phone, because I've got my, I'm have got. i speaking through my phone, I've left my, um, my, my computer speaker on at the same time. 
because all the computer audio on your hoodie's laptop, it says it's fine and everything, and the settings are on 100%. Can you, so can you, no, can you can you please see what the problem is on his laptop? So I'm just going to uh, log on to Zoom on my phone and try and do it. Yeah, try and do it on your iPhone on, or on your, <laughs> on your pad through through the phone and see what happens. Yeah, I'm going to do. I'll do that now. Okay. Okay. That's the best thing to do. Well, meanwhile, Nathan, do you want to talk about the defence of Chazonis while we're waiting to... Uh... Yes. Yeah, I think uh, I was going to speak more about it with Chazon Marx uh, later on there about his book. Um, but I'll tell you uh, that... OK. And then... Um... Oh, no. So... And Chaz so Hazel Marx was a very, very wonderful teacher to me, is it? and he encouraged me at a very young age. Um, and he installed in me a, a love, not only for Chazonis, but also for the history of Chazonis. And, he, and he, told me, he told me that uh, at a young age that he would teach me Shabbos and Yom Tov, and Taki, the Tel Aviv Cantoral Institute, would teach me Rosh Hashanah Yom Kit. He said, I can't teach you Rosh Hashanah and give it, I'll teach you. Shabbos and, Shabbos and Yom Tov. It's one of the small things I remember uh, that he told me. But I'm just waiting. I want to, I have a lot of questions for him to speak about. Uh, so we'll just wait for him for a second. Why don't you sing meanwhile? Uh, Hazen, hello. You, you, I'm very nervous to sing in front of you. Nathan, <laughs> you're... You. You are full of confidence. Don't worry about it. That's good. That's good. I'm doing quite well, aren't I, considering the technical difficulties? Yeah, your sound is just slightly lower, but it needs to maybe just need raise... To use, need to use more Kopstimo. Yeah, it all depends where you're singing from. Oh, I'm singing from... I'm uh, far away. My grandfather used to say... Do you, if someone used to say to him, I can sing, I'll sing to you, he goes, do you know far, far away? <laughs> anyway is your hood connected yet I don't think so Perhaps can you hear us Nathan tell us about your studies and, and how you got on and... there's a problem on the signal in the house well, after Hazen Marx, I went to Tel Aviv, the Tel Aviv Cantoral Institute and I studied with Chaim Feifel, Naftali Hershtik. And most people don't realise that Naftali Hershtik and Chaim Feifel had very different styles. Chaim Feifel was very much, he was very much into improvisation. I'm sure Sol Zim, who is here now, he knew Chaim Feifel. I remember once Hazen Zim came to Taki. And he was very friendly with 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 Chaim Feifel, and they knew each. I think they studied together with Wax, uh, Max Waldman together. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, is that true, Sol? Max Wahlberg, and yes, Max. for one year he was in his last yeah. year, and I was just starting. But I know Chaim very well because we first one year that we were together, we were always like a chavrusa. It was wonderful. It was he, a he was he. He, I'm so sad that he was nifty. He was such a genius. And he, he, he was so such a lovely man. Genius of Chazonis. How are we doing, Chazon Marx? Can you hear me? Mute, I'll mute, yeah. I'm going to stop the video. I wanted to go back on here. Anyway, so I'm fine. He was a in this connection in the signal in the house. Can you do it on your hooter? Can you, uh, Melanie? Can you not do it on the on your cell phone? Hi, Melanie. Hi. Just to say, I can't get in on my phone either. 
because there seems to be a problem with the connection. So I'm going to try on the original laptop. I'm going to go back and try as if I can set it up on there again. Can you put yourself on mute while you're doing it? Yes, thank you. Thank you for doing that. That will be good. And uh, you, okay. you, Nathan, you can continue to talk about your okay, training. I can do Whatever. Yes. yes. I'm going back to the original laptop. And see. I'll do it in the other room, okay? okay. I'm just wondering yes. whether it's worth me getting in the car and picking you up, Yoda, and bringing ah. you to, to me. It's just the thought it'd take me 10 minutes to get to you and 10 minutes to get back, but. Uh. Uh, Nathan, continue, yes. please. Yes. So Chaim, I'll tell you a bit. Of, I'll tell you about Chaim. He was a genius, and he never, he never told you uh, that you were good. <laughs> he always told you what you needed to improve, and that was a very. He was a very uh, sincere. And I have recordings of him where he screamed at me uh, in lessons. You know, he told me you don't know what you're talking about. You know, he, he told me to my face that you don't know anything. And he, and he, and he, and he told, and he was a very. Uh, but later on, he became a lot sweeter, and and he and I studied with him for for over five years, and he was just a, a genius in every respect. He taught me nusach, what all the modes, mogin ovos, uh, uh, fregish, all these things. He he was a master of those. He was a master of kachko. He taught kachko, uh, and he taught uh, and and um, and 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 uh, he was really a genius in every in every respect, and. Of course, um, I had Natali Hershik, who was what his genius was, is that when he taught Nusuch, he brought out an electric organ and he sang. He closed his eyes. I think it's from Simcha Kosovitsky, but he, when he taught Nusuch, his artistry, he didn't need to teach us anything. He just needed to sing to us and we would listen to him. And he was just the listening to Hazen Hershtik was, a, was, was fantastic. He was really, you learned a lot. And from him as a person, his stories, oh, Hazen Marx has joined. Is that good or bad? Can we hear him or not? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, you, we can hear you. I think Nathan can continue you. until you heard a. Um, yeah. Is, is settled. And Hazen Hershtik always told us the importance of respecting the history of Chazonus as well. I think a lot of the problem is that Chazonim now, they do not look back. We as Chazonim have a duty to carry with us all of the history with us. We have to look from the past, we have to take from the past. And put it to the put it to the future, and that's very difficult. And we have a lot of people fighting us with it, but we have a, that's our duty. It's also our duty as Chazonim to wear our hat and gown, and that's what I'm going to talk about with Chazan Marks hopefully later. I actually make hats and gowns, but that's nothing to do. I'm not trying to sell any because believe me, I haven't got <laughs> uh, with me. I have to I have to learn every week the, the to Torah reading, the laning. So I haven't got time to make hats and gowns, but it's very important for a chazan to wear his hat and gown. It's our tradition. We have many traditions, and that is one that has really, really been forgotten. And that is one that I'm going to talk about later on with Hazen Marx, and that he is one of the few that still wears his hat and gown. And that is something we, as chazanim, Hazen Hershtik taught us to have an appreciation for the past. And, and, uh, and that is... Uh, that is very important. And I had wonderful voice teachers in, in Takim. Uh, one of my voice teachers was Shmuel Berlard, who was a German. He was a wonderful voice teacher. And it's so important for every chazan, doesn't matter how wonderfully you sing, you have to get a voice teacher, a good voice teacher, to preserve your voice, make sure that you'll be singing for years, not just for, the, for, for a short time. Even if you have a beautiful voice, you have to sing correctly. And it's also uh, at Taki we learned notes and musical theory, and uh, it was really very important for a chazan to know. And uh, how are we doing? Thank you. I'm just going to ask Yehuda if he can hear. 
Uh, Yehuda, can you hear us now? Uh, you're muted. You have to unmute. Um, can you hear us now? Can you yes. hear? Yes, I can. You can. Okay. Or, well, let's yeah. go straight back then to Nathan yep. and Yehuda um, talk to each other. Sorry about that, Yehuda. It's very discomforting for oh, yeah. you, but we're very glad to have you back comfortable with us and that you can hear. Cousin Marks. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry I missed your talk. I, I, talk, I said such <laughs> lovely things. I said such lovely things about you, but I'm not. Really I'm sure. Sure. I bet not. I bet not. Yeah. I, I know what you're like. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm like. So, but, so I just want no, to. Ask I know you, Scousers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had the great Hazen Bornstein in Liverpool, so yes, something. We did something. He did something right. right. He and, did. And he saved his Naftali life. Naftali Halter. We had in Liverpool. Fantastic. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, and your grandfather. Add... Oh, yes. He was the Your greatest. grandfather, Cousin Maurice Katanga. He was very good. Excellent. He was wonderful. And I want to ask you, Cousin Marks, yeah. tell us, please, about your early life in Manchester and how you became interested in, in cantorial music. Right. My early life in Manchester. I'm born in Manchester. I come from a very orthodox family, so I went. I belonged to a very orthodox school called Masika Das, which doesn't have a cousin, but had some very good doveners. Some of the people that took this service there could have been chazonim and were chazonim, but didn't make a profession of it. So I was always attracted to good voices and heartfelt chazonas. I loved chazonas with feeling. So from a very early age, from about five, six, already I wanted to be a cousin. I was already singing with a towel over my shoulders like Rosenblatt, although I'm nothing like Rosenblatt, but I would sing with a bath towel from a boy of six, and I begged my father to take me to school with a cousin, and my father would take me when I was a good boy to Central Shul, to the old Central Shul in Hayward Street in Manchester, which had great chazonim in, in its past, like Alexander Roberts, Bowarski, Price, Landenberg, and Aaron Siegel, they had a great chazonim there, and I used to listen to Chazan Haber, and I really enjoyed his davening. He based his davening on the great Yeshua Vida. Chazan Haber was from Hungary, and he based his style on Yeshua Vida, who likewise was a Hungarian. I also used to go to listen to Chazan Helman a lot, but his davening was very different because he sang with a choir. And I always preferred chazonas without a choir, but that's a personal taste. So I came... From, as I say, from an Orthodox family. Um, and I started listening to Chazonim from a very early age. I used to go and walk to listen to Chaz different Chazonim. I imagine in those days in Manchester, every English shul, every Anglicised shul had a cousin. That walk canonicals, they walk canonicals, and they took it very seriously. Only one or two were full time, but the others all had a cousin. You know, you went to shul, you could hear a Rosenblatt, you hear a Kavartin, you would hear regular pieces of Chazonim. There was no such thing in those days as happy clappy services. Congregational singing, yes, but that wasn't the hormone. When I used to go to hear a cousin, I can tell you what Hillman sang when I was a kid. I can tell you what Haber sang as a kid, but what congregational tunes he sang, I cannot do. Because in those days, automatically, the cousin would sing congregational tunes, I switched off. It didn't move me. I was only moved by real neshama, by real heartfelt chazonas, and that's what I remember. Likewise, and when that, I was in... Yes, that is something you said in your book, that the yes. difference between a bow to filler and the chazan is that his tunes. His tunes, yes. So a chazan, you don't judge by his tunes. You judge him by his debate, how he sings the Tikanta Shavos, how he sings the Rene what interpretation is it there? So when the people said they walked miles to hear a chazan, it wasn't to hear his tunes or to see what congregational singing he did. It was to see how he sang, how he interpreted a Misha Berah, how he interpreted the Tikanta Shavos. That is a true art of chazanas. And that's only found in East European chazanas. Western European chazanas is also very good but it's not got the same fire. It's not got the same move, emotional appeal as East European. And this is proven by a story of there was a great cousin called Arya Leib Rotman, one of those great Zogachas on him. He was a student from Rimsky Korsakov, the great composer. He used to take voice lessons from Rimsky Korsakov. And one day he gave Rimsky Korsakov 
he gave him a book of East European Chazonis. Rimsky Korsakov, the week after, he returned it to him without giving him a compliment. So Ariel Rotman thought maybe he didn't like it. So he gave next week, he gave him a book of Western European Chazonis. Again, a week later, Rimsky Korsakov gave him the book back and again, didn't give him a compliment. So he said to him, is anything wrong with these books? Didn't the music appeal to you? And Rimsky Korsakov said to him, the first book you gave me, of East European Chazonis, he said, that's something unique to the Jewish people. But your book he gave me of Western European Chazonis, he said, we non-Jews could, com could compose better than you. East European Chazonis is something very unique and very Jewish. And it's very Jewish. interesting that you, that in England, in England, yeah. that there's a tradition that the Chazonim that came from Poland and Russia and came to these English shuls, they had to sing anglicized pieces. But as you've told me on many occasions, that yes. a great cousin, a real great cousin, can sing a piece by Lewandowski or Zoltzer and still sound like a cousin. That's a true, a great yes. cousin has to be able to do both, right? Yes. It's just to do it. Kavatin does. You can hear Kavatin do some real West European chazonas. Even Rosenblatt has some Western pieces, like his Vashomru, which is composed by Donichevsky. Rosenblatt sings, it's not his own piece. It's Western European, but he sings it beautifully. And same with Donichevsky's uh, Kadusha Kavoido Mimkoim. It's West European, but it's still very, very beautiful. So the, you have to have a nod. You have to do both. But generally, East European is what I, moves me. But I do like a bit of Western European as well. It is a question of personal taste, isn't it? Personal taste, yes, definitely, definitely. And tell us, you. so you. I, I just want to say one thing about that. It's very interesting because many, I'm a chazan in Germany, many Western chazonim, and, and many chazonim, especially now, when it comes to Shabbos Rosh Chodesh, and they say Atta Yitzhar mm. Tor, many of them don't sing a piece for that. And you told me, I don't know if you, we won't say the name of the chazan who it was, in Manchester, you went to mm. war... Quite a quite a, a distance, and he didn't sing anything for Antonio mm. Sound. Yes, I found that terrible. And I, in my own show, as you know, I let Chazonim take the armor. People phone me up and say, "Would you like to be a guy? Can we be a guest chazan in your show? If it's good." I say okay, and one particular Shabbos was Shabbos Hanukkah Rosh Chodesh. Shabbos Rosh Chodesh Hanukkah. Chazan asked me, "He's coming to Manchester. Can you daven in my shul on Shabbos Rosh Chodesh Hanukkah?" I said to him, "I'll allow you to daven for the Ahmed if you can sing Ato Yitzato or Al Hanisim. If you can't emphasize either of those two pieces on that particular Shabbos, you can't daven because those are the pieces that have to be highlighted on that Shabbos." And to me, not to emphasize those two pieces, how often do you get anti Sata? anti Sata is maybe twice or the most three times a year. And just to treat it like an ordinary piece is very unprofessional, in my opinion. And that comes back to your book. <laughs> what is also very good about your book, and we're going to speak about your book later, for those that missed it, I just want to say very quickly, for those who want to order it, it's yehudamarks21 at gmail.com. You can email him and he'll send you a copy of it and we'll sort that out. Yeah, um, I have to wait a bit because they're currently out of print, but I'll get some new ones printed. But the one <laughs> of the, the, cover, one of the, the cover is here. <laughs> very good. Uh, it's, a, it's a great collection of photos, isn't it? One cousin it, said that. Yes, it did. <laughs> but but it, that is a good thing about your book, as I said, that it is appropriate because you can you can look in the book what Shabbos is it it's Shabbos so and so and you can say oh it says in the book that I should sing Misha Beiruch this Shabbos because it's connected That's to the right. Because connected to the Parsha, well, you read the Torah when you read the curses. So the whole world, the whole world jury has read the curses. So that's a time when to bless the congregation. That's when you would sing a Misha Beiruch. You know, and, and likewise, when in the Sefer Vayikhi, when Yaakov blesses his children, so you take a cue from there and say, well, Yaakov's blessing the, the people, so we should. And that's when to sing a Misha Baruch. And I, my book tells you each Shabbos what to sing. You know, they can find a connection either to the Sefer or to some events. It's all it's in here. And we're going we're gonna to get in more, into more detail about it later on. And I yes. want to ask you, now we've spoken a bit about your early life and the Chazonim, you heard Hazen Haber, you heard... Mm. Uh, you, you heard, uh, uh, yeah, and you, you heard a few others. Why did you go to Jews College? Why did I go to Jews College? Yeah. Because 
I wanted to be a cousin, and if I would have gone privately to people like Cousin Hape or Cousin Hillman, I wouldn't have got a diploma. Now, I'm not saying that the best Khazalim came out from Jews College. There are some very, very good Khazalim, just as good as those that trained in Jews College. I'll be perfectly fair. Some of the top Khazalim in this country didn't even go to Jews College. But I wanted a cantorial diploma, and Jews College was that place where to get it. And thankfully, I did get it after four years. And I wanted to go to Reverend Bro. I was a full-time course. I didn't want to just go once an evening, uh, once a week to Khazan Hape or Khazan Hillman. So I did go to Jews College, where I studied four years full-time. And, 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 and tell us about Reverend Brill, because every, 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 most professionals in London over the age of whatever, 50, 60, were trained by Reverend Brill, and everyone knows about Reverend Brill. Can you tell us a bit about what he taught you and him as a person, what he was like as a teacher? As a teacher, person. he was. He was, he was a great personality. He was a fantastic Talmud Chochum. Whenever a lecturer in Jewish college heard, quoted from the Talmud, he could finish the sentence. He heard a vote from Gomorrah, he could finish. He was a child prodigy. At the age of six, he said he accompanied David Reitman when he came, I think, to this country. So he was already a musician at a very early age. He was close with Reutemann. He knew Steinberg. He knew Mordechai Hirschman, but didn't know the Manchester Hirschman, his brother. Didn't know Solomon Hirschman, but knew Mordechai Hirschman. And he knew the Bornsteins, was very close with them. Um, he, he was very close with Sol, with uh, Shlomo Stern, the great cousin of Pressburg. He was, was very close with a lot of the great Khazanim. So he was a link to the old Khazanim of old. As a teacher, he was, he was a fantastic teacher. I thought he was best in voice production and in perish Hamilis. He would tell you how to interpret each word. If you held a word too long, he would say, why are you holding this word? Like Asher or Kol. If it didn't mean anything, you would do a Kolotora on Asher, he would say, don't mean it, don't do a Kolotora on that word. Do something on, on a word that's more, on Kiddush or something that has more significance. Yeah, so he was an expert on perish Hamilis. Interpretation. And he, he really helped loads of Khazanim. He accompanied world famous Khazanim like Moshe Stone, Yeshua Lera on their records. You see, accompanied by Reverend Brill. And he was not only just a, he didn't just play the piano, he would tell them they would come to Riaz. I heard it myself. And Hainovitz came, another Khazanim came. He would tell them how to bring out their voice. I remember Louis Danto came to the college and he sang to Louis Danto, sang to Reverend Brill. And Reverend Brill said, Why do you sing from here? He tells him, You're singing all from your head. Why don't you give your voice some bodily support? And he told him how to do it. And Louis Janto flushed with excitement. His face went red with excitement. He said, you should be in a top place. What are you doing here? Reverend Brill was an opera singer. He used to sing on the radio in Dublin. He was an opera singer. He had a fantastic voice himself, even till the end. He was a brilliant, very dramatic cousin. The people that heard him say he was very Germanic in style. Although he taught East European, loved East European, that he himself was a very Germanic style governor. A bit like Yisrael Alta. He listens to recordings of Yisrael Alta. He sounds very Germanic. But his compositions, like as a cafe, what he composed for Moshe Kozovsky, you can't imagine Yisrael Alta singing a piece like that. His voice is too Germanic. His compositions and Yisrael Alta himself are chalk and cheese. You get that with, with, with a few cars on him. So Reverend Brill was himself Germanic kind of cousin, even though he was born in Odessa, but he loved East European. He absolutely loved Khazanim that could sing. He always used to say, cousin that can't sing Amr Rabbi Loza is no cousin. So he's real. anyone that sings Amr Rabbi Loza has to be East European. So he was very good. He was very strict. I was very scared of him. A lot of Khazanim used to come to London and people asked them, why didn't you come and pay Reverend Brill a visit? These were world friends of Khazanim. I'm not going to mention the names. And they said they didn't want to go and visit him. They were scared because he could tell you to pieces on a bad day <laughs> you know it was in one of his moods he could tear you to pieces and not everybody could do it not everybody went to see him but he he taught for over 35 40 years taught for a very long time and his favorite student was johnny glock he loved johnny glock johnny glock he actually said was his favorite student i think after johnny glock i think it could have been simon sparrow but he really loved his job in his honest and johnny glock was very much in his style he's classical and yet got your charm he's got feeling He's got the best of both worlds. The Reverend Bill was a very good teacher. But his Nusak, he based his Nusak on Bear's book of Baltavilla, which is very westernized. So it's not East European. So when I do Marovas, like say, and Pesach and Shlesh Golim, my Marovas is Western. It's Western. It's not East European. When I sang it for my diploma to Reverend Rafa Levy, a long standing cousin of New West End, he told me it's a rubbish Nusak. He said it's a very poor Nusak. 
she had a very poor nusach, but it's there and there. But when you compare it to East European, East European nusach is much nicer. Theirs is a very good book, as I say, it's a very good, it's a bread and butter, it's called the Baltafella. But, um, but our next teacher, Reverend Sherman, he excelled in East European nusach. So his nusach was better, but Reverend Brill was a better teacher in voice production, in Perisha Melis, and Reverend Brill had great charisma as well. But Reverend Sherman was a more heart sick governor. Uh, you you were you were in a rare situation that you were one of his last students, weren't you? I was I was I was his second last student, but his youngest student by far. His, young his youngest student. I'm his youngest student. I wasn't the last. I was the second last. Jonathan Altman was the last, but I'm um, a lot younger than Jonathan Altman. Uh, was it was it was it intimidating to go to London at such a young age to study Chazonus? With were the people there? Were they supportive with you? And that were they, or did they just think, oh, he's Same too young? Show. No, they let me in. I was sixteen at the time. I left school already at fourteen, believe it or not, because I went to a Hasidic school. And at fourteen, I was the oldest in my school. I went to Kesatoria, Manchester, and at fourteen, I was the oldest in school already. And so I had to go to yeshiva. I stayed in yeshiva for just under two years. So about sixteen and a half, I was already in Jewish college, the youngest student at the time. And that that is, and you know, you you've you've spoken about what you liked about Jews College was the intense study. It wasn't just mm. uh, twice a week. Do you think that is important for a chazan to have intense study chazonus? It should be a full-time course for five years it or should. whatever. Yeah, it should. But Jews College cantonal class wasn't intense enough. When we start, when I started, when I was in the West End, when the college was in its greatest place in the Montague place, it was just a two, three hour day. 11 o'clock, Reverend Brill's class was till one. And then on a Monday, he would teach for half an hour for music. He would teach once a week voice production and two hours of Nusach a day. And the rest of the afternoon, my first year, you could do what you liked. So I did. And my next greatest love after Chazonis is touring. So I went to all the museums, all the castles, all the museums and all the different parts of London, all the famous parks. And that's what I did in the afternoon. Later, we complained, this is not right. We're coming all the way from Manchester. And we're just learning, learning two hours a day. Reverend Brill only taught two hours a day. So later, we learned Gomorrah. We learned Denim, that irrelevance uh, for a cousin. But we should have learned much more. You can't learn. You can't really learn music one for one, uh, one, hour, one hour a week. You have to learn more music, voice production, uh, theory and all these kind of things, which we didn't really do. And we should have, but still, I'm very privileged to have Reverend Brill as a teacher because he was a great, as was Reverend Sherman in his own way. So the course might have not been perfect, wasn't intense enough, but they were very good teachers. And now we're going to, we, we, you've told us about your time in Jews College and we're very, it's very interesting. I want to ask you, when you finished and you got your cantorial diploma, where yeah. did you go after that what was the what was the journey because you obviously you ended up in Heaton Park you didn't go straight to Heaton Park did you no I had a five-year gap a five-year gap where I acted as guest cousin all over the place in Sweden and in this country all over I've done it in about 20 synagogues in Great Britain um, but one of the reasons why the code by the course folded I was this last student in the last class so to speak one of the reasons why I folded was because there were no jobs there were no vacancies schools no longer were taking full-time because on him by full-time we mean full-time dabbling every week and having a full-time panasa from it. So the only shuls I were taking were part-time and they were few and well, I'm a part-time cousin, but I dab in every single week. I go to shul every day. I, go, I do some levires. I do some unveilings. I visit the sick. And I'm only called a part-time cousin. Years back, I would have been called full-time, but that's today. I'm a part-time. I'm dabbling every Shabbos, every Friday night in England. That's called part-time. It, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> go ahead. There was no, there was no vacancies or no vacancies anymore for a full-time cousin. And that's why the course folded very sadly. And even part-time, very few schools, very few openings came about already from the 1990s, almost the 1980s. There were very few schools that were looking for cousin anymore. A lot of, a lot of the old mm -hmm. ones were nicked them and they didn't employ a cousin after that, did they? That's right. That's absolutely right. So what, what so you, tell us, you, you, but eventually you got to Heaton Park and yes. you've been in Heaton Park for 30, 30, is it 35 years? From 1990, 1990, 90. how many years is that? Oh, I'm not good at mathematics. 31, 31, 32, 31, 31 years. You, you, you are the longest cousin that they, the, the longest minister, the longest standing minister they've had, right? 
in the in the in the my longest time. cousin I've had. Yes, don't forget our school's been going for seventy years, and we've only had three Rabboni in that time. So they've been very good with rabbis. We have a previous minister. But this one, Rabbi Walk, has been for about thirteen years. I think at least thirteen, fifteen years. Uh, Reverend Oldsworth was there for about thirty-five years. So he was there, and uh, before him was Rabbi Wallach, who for many years acted as a cousin as well, and he was there for another thirty, forty, or thirty-five years. So the ministers have been long, but we've had over ten years on him. And the ten and, and the some of them are, are related. Some of them are related. That's right. right. The very first cousin was cousin Freilich, who left our shul to go to Hampstead on the suburb, where his great nephew is a cousin. After uh, him was my cousin cousin Nemtsov, whose son is David Nemtsov, a famous cousin in Toronto. So his father was a second cousin. Then Rabbi Wallach came along. And Rabbi Willick acted as a cousin. Don't forget, Rabbi Willick was a cousin to cousin Stern, Solomon Stern, that is, from, from Pressburg and Manchester and Leeds. And therefore, he knew his honest inside out. His father was a cousin. So he acted as a cousin for about 20, 30 years. And only towards the end of his career, when he got Samicha, he thought, well, it passed. It passed for a rabbi to be a cousin. And he no longer... And he no longer wanted to uh, do, do chazanas anymore, and he thought he'll just be the rabbi. So then we got a cousin by the name of Shmuel Terry, who was a fantastic cousin, a student of Judy, had a brilliant voice. And then after Terry, we had Shimon Halpern, the brother of uh, Rabbi Conan Halpern of Golders Green. And then we had Lionel Rabinovich for a short time. Um, we had my cousin out from Trep. Um, we had Michael Isdale. And then we had uh, Harvey Miller. And then Michael Simon and myself. And, uh, so for short, uh, it's, well. it's amazing. It's amazing you can name all your predecessors like that. And I'm sure name you can. You, cousin Freilich came to hear me. I went to him for a voice lesson once or twice in when he was in London, and he came to hear me. He still got relatives in Arsenal today. So I knew the very first cousin. The second cousin was my cousin, and then Rabbi Wallach. Of course, I didn't know, but then Shimon Halpern. I was a good friend of him, uh, and you might know Michael Simon, and you Harvey Miller, and you Michael Isdale. I just spoke to Michael Isdale before. Uh, I spoke to Harvey Miller the other week. So I'm there, I've known virtually all of them, except your wife. I didn't know uh, a bit of his salt. The How has the shul changed in your time there? You've been there for a long time. Yeah, well, it's a very anglicised shul. It's a very anglicised shul. It's um, and therefore it relies. There's not a, there's not a load of people that can get up there. I wanted to take a service. They're only too happy that they've got a cousin, they've got somebody leading the congregation, and that's very good. When you have too many by the bottom there that want to govern, then your job's in jeopardy. You know, so when you when there's nobody there that wants to actually do it on a Shabbos, and they're not not all of them, you know, that religiously inclined either. So you know, then it's okay. But thankfully, I've changed myself. I'm much more congregational than I used to be. But despite that, I do sing a piece of Kazanas every single week without fail. I always have done. And please, at, at least at least one piece. You, you say it's important for the to one sing one. piece. One. Has it? one piece. One piece. A congregational one like him in Kaimcha. I'll do a congregational one in Kaimcha, okay, I'll do a congregational, and I normally will take a piece in Mosav and do just one piece. Be it Yokum be it Misha Berach, be it Kanta Shabbos, be it Omar Rabeloza, I'll do one piece of Chazolis, but not more. And they're going to sing a Rishkodesh Benching and then do Omar Rabeloza. I think a cousin that does that today is stupid, right? Well, as a kid, I used to go and hear cousin Hillman. He would sing about five, six pieces on a Shabbos morning. It's a different day and age. You can't do that now, unfortunately. But today you only can do one to two pieces, one Kazanas piece and some congregational singing. That's all you can do. But you definitely need to do one Kazanas piece. If you're not going to do the Kazanas piece, you're not a cousin, you're just a song leader. You've got to be a prayer leader. So it's important you do that piece. What, what, what's something that's very oh, interesting yeah. is that you're always with a tie and a jacket. Why, why is that? Why do you feel a chazan? should always be dressed mm. and why should he wear it? and it, when it leads into the and it leads into what I'm going to say about the hat and gown but why is that important when you're dabbling for Hashem I mean if you had a you had an audience in front of the queen you wouldn't go to her just with your shirt on or short trousers you know you're dabbling to Hashem so I think you should be well dressed. I don't think it's Chukas Goy. The Goy actually took it from us. It tells you the coin God all wore it, Lakovid Ulisibaris, for the beauty and, and grand of Lakovid Ulisibaris, to pray to you know, for the beauty and glory of God. And that's what we should do. It gives a sense of dignity and it gives you a link. It creates a link to the old Chazorim. Once a, once a shul says, 
don't wear your cantorial garb anymore. Then, you know, the next week they're going to tell you not to repeat words. Then they're going to tell you to do away with chazalas. That's the first step of getting rid of a cousin is to do away with the garb. And, 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 and of course, yeah. what day-to-day, day-to-day clothing. What, for example, whenever we saw Hazen Hillman in the streets, he always had a suit yeah. on. And he never walked with jeans always. and a shirt. Never, you, never, you, never. You see Chazonim... You see Chazonim now, you think that they're the bin men. You would do. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Why, no, why, I'm always with the suit. Yeah. But why do you feel it's important for a Chazan to dress in a suit every day? In a suit, not, not, well, not when you have I, I wouldn't say every day. I wouldn't say it's important. I'm just thinking one is when you're dabbing for the omelet, it's important. Now you're there dressed during the week is another story. I generally would dress it because I am cold blooded. I'm warm hearted. I am a very cold person. I can never, I don't think I've ever, hard, ever walked out in the street with just one shirt, ever, mm-hmm. even as a kid, because I am cold. I am a cold blooded person, hopefully warm hearted, and therefore I only, always need to be warm. <laughs> but the Chazonim, the Chazonim of the olden days, they did. They they wore a suit in the streets. Scarf, the same much because of whiskey. A month before Rosh Hashanah, would wrap up well, have a scarf round his uh, mouth uh, in order to protect his voice. And Chagi, on a, Chagi was chasen in uh, in South Africa okay. on a boiling hot day. He wouldn't allow any of the windows to be open. He would be seen closing all the shawl windows, and he could get away with it with a voice like Chagi. He could get away with it. <laughs> you know, Chagi was a vocal technique. One of my favourite colors on him, beautiful. And who? Go on, go on. Yes. Yeah. And those days a chasen ruled. The chasen wanted windows closing; they were to be closed. No one stopped with Kagi. You know, you had to be only too thankful. You have such a great, beautiful voice uh, leading the service. What that leads me, what I was going to say to you is that which chazonim do you? Mm. What what sort of chazonim do you like? Which chazonim do you have a preference over? Well, I love East European, as I say. I love East European chazonim. One of my favourite, I mean, real all-time favourite, I would say, would be Joseph Schlisky. I love Joseph Schlisky. I love his vocal technique. And it's sad that very few people sing, although now we've got David Mutlu, who sings his pieces beautifully. Um, he's really very good. But I love Joseph Schlisky. I just love the height of his voice. I think he's a golden tenor. And his coloratura on the Oilem Yehodom, to Gantu Shabbos, on Tanya Rabachin, is out of this world. So I love Schlesky. I love Leibler Waldman as well. I love he's baritonal, but he's beautiful. He's to the point. He's not over the top. He's warm. It's heartsick. He puts melodies here and there. And he is beautiful. I love Waldman. I love Schlesky. I would say those two are my favorite. And I also love Simon House. Simon House is beautiful. Beautiful voice. Beautiful style. So I'd say those are amongst. I love Kapu Kagan as well. And I love Kagi. Most of the old East European Pazonim, I love them all. They're all very great. It's important for a chazan to love chazonus, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to be passionate about it. If a person came to me, wanted to learn chazonus with me, I don't believe in teaching Nosach to people that are not interested in chazonus. I don't believe in making Nosach accessible to all, available to all, because that's in the end is just going to harm chazonus. Just going to harm chazonus. Because then if you teach a layman Nosach, then they're going to say, well, we can do it. I'll do need a chazan for. So I don't believe I don't believe in teaching people that not only got good voices, but really love chazonus. Really got to be passionate about chazonus. And that way, there's only very few jobs out there. So why should I teach somebody a job when he's not even interested in it? He's not even interested in chazonus. He just wants to go you know just wants to because he, he likes singing like using his voice but doesn't have a love of chazonas i want to take him on it's better if he joins <laughs> pardon better what better, better if he joins a choir if he wants to sing if he wants to sing well if he had I, i'll try and develop a love of chazonas but if he's not got a love of chazonas i don't believe in making it not like available to lay people i don't think it's a good strategy at all i think it's just going to harm us on him yes in the long yes run. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that you can hear some chazonim when they're singing. You can tell if a chazan has been listening to chazonus or not, can't you? You can, you by his warmth. By his warmth. You judge him by his kavana, by his warmth. And if he's not got a warm style of davening, it's not chazonus. But sometimes you can develop it. Sometimes you can't develop it. But it depends on the person, you know. But many times now, you get people just coming to you. They want to earn a few extra, a bit of extra money on the side, but don't have any any love for the liturgy or chazanas or tradition and I just don't believe in making this available for them. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about your your, your book. Yes. And 
it, it is an important book. And I think personally, the most important part of it. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to say. Mm. No, you can't copy it. You can't copy uh, I'm glad to see you're not put in the waste paper bin. Yeah. I'm glad, to, <laughs> glad to see it's not in the recycle bin. Yes. The most important part of it, seriously, is the, is the list of um, yacht sites yes. that you have. And that mm. is what you speak about a lot, is that every, most, most of the, a lot of names are in here and you're, and you're searching, aren't you, to try and find more. And one of your things that you do, which I've seen you do, is say a Capital uh, to Hillim on the yacht side of a chasm. Yes. On, on, so on, I believe on, every chasm, every chasm, wherever you are, you should always learn Mishnahis for the chasm uh, that were in your town. So I learn Mishnahis for all the chasm that grace Manchester because I'm a chasm in Manchester. So whoever it was, be it a top chasm, be a mediocre chasm, if he's passed away, I think it's your duty to learn Mishnahis for, for, for that chasm. I don't always do it on the date, but I do it very near to the date. So I've made a list. I've got a separate list. In here, I've just got a list of world famous Khazanim. I've got a separate one just of Manchester Khazanim, but I've got some who are just local Khazanim and weren't really known. But the fact that I gave years of service to the community and I'm a Khazan myself, I think you have to recognize that and learn Mishnahis. And that creates a link between you and the, and the, and the Khazan, the town that you're a Khazan in, and it creates a link with the masters. I think you should do that with the masters. I felt passionately, uh, you know, on his honours. And uh, as you well know, I went to uh, I, I, one of the one of my favourite cousins of Manchester was Hassan Solomon Kupfer, who was a world famous cousin before he came to Manchester. Was in Leipzig, and uh, from Birnbaum's Contorial School, he was his favourite student. From all his great students, but Kupfer was. His, his favorite student. He was has in a new synagogue. He made recordings very beautifully. But he has no surviving relatives anymore. He has absolutely. He had one. He had two daughters who were classical pianists, and he had one grandson. All passed away. And his grave. It took me a long time to find where his grave was. Found it in Amsterdam. Nobody visited it. It was completely dilapidated. And this is a world famous cousin. And thankfully, I managed to renovate it myself. Now, I mentioned to Alex Clyde the other day that Mombach, world-famous composer called Mombach, uh, um, what was the first name? Was it Julius? Julius Mombach? Julius, yeah, um, Julius. Uh, Israel was it Israel Lazarus? Israel Lazarus, is, is Lazarus Israel, Julius. Julius, something, yeah. Julius Mombach. So Israel Lazarus Mombach it was. And I believe his grave is in very poor condition. He never had any children. And I think as Chazonim, or he's buried in London and West Ham Cemetery, we should do something about it. I tried Absolutely. to do it. As you know, in Liverpool, but Bornstein's a different thing. Bornstein, Herman Bornstein is buried in Broad Green. Again, his grave is the wording is completely gone, but he had children, he had grandchildren, and nothing I can do. It's up to his family to uh, to do something. The Mombach didn't leave any any children, any uh, no descendants. It's up to us because he gave such pleasure and he, mm. he, he created such good works. We owe an obligation mm. to get that grave sorted. It's a grave situation. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I'll give you 10p, 10p for that. 10p, 10p for that. Is that all? Is that all? I want more from you than that. But you're not doing it. you off. It is very amazing. You know, people don't realise, people speak yeah. in, in England. In England, mm. Dovi Kozovitsky came to the UK. Yes. And he wasn't necessarily treated that well. But people don't realise is that in London, in the north, in Liverpool, Manchester, in Wales, all these places had world famous Chazonim and world class Chazonim. World class goes on him, absolutely. Even places like Hall, Grimsby, now world class goes on him. You know, it was in St. Anne's. It was important for a shul in those days to have a chasm. chasm I always say a, a shul without a chasm is a shul without a shabba, is a shul without a heart. You need somebody to daven for you, to daven with passion, to daven with emotion, and to know the nosach. And you, without that, just to run through it and say, anybody could do it now today. Everybody said, well, anybody can do it. Anyone can get up there and do it. As it's written in my book, a world famous rabbi was uh, speaking on the slichos. And after he gave, he gave his slichos address, he said, is there anybody here that can do the slichos and can get up and read the slichos without any preparation on the first, a week before Rosh Hashanah, just asking anybody to do it? That's the value of prayer. In eyes for some rabbis, if sadly enough, and that's why you need a, a trained professional. And we never can train enough, we always need to train ourselves more. No matter where we've learned, we need to learn more. And that's why I'm thankful to, to Geraldine and Alex for all the, and Hirsch for all the good work they do in ECA. I mean, I've been to ECA conventions and I've learned loads, I've increased my repertoire a hundredfold because I go to ECA. 
you can never think, you can never think, he knows it all because he had a few lessons from this one and a few lessons from that. You need to update and listen to other people's experiences. And that's why you see it's so valuable to Khazanas and everybody should try and go to the conventions. That's right. And especially the conventions uh, to, the to conventions know your so things. much. You hear different ideas, how this one sings this, and you hear voice, ideas on voice production, music, share experiences. It's a lifeline to Khazanas. A lifeline to put on him, and we're, we're lucky to have uh, Alex to, to have, sort yeah, it out. Alex, we have a good friend, we're lucky to have Alex and Geraldine. They have done so much work and revival, and made a great revival of Kazonis. Hopefully, at least we can upgrade our skills, and it's there for anybody to do so. One, one of the things that I must say quickly is that why, why is it you wrote in your book, and we're gonna, we're gonna open up for questions uh, later as well, yeah. uh, more for anyone to ask a question later. Mm. Um, it's important for a young cousin to know if any, if you're lucky to land a job and you have a job, mm. a relationship with the rabbis and the. Can you say something about us about the relationship a cousin has to have between a boy and if you have a difficult gabai or a difficult warden, what is the what is the correct way to deal with it? What can you do about it? Well, it's very hard. I mean, all Khazanim have had bad go by him, but you've got to say to yourself, no matter how bad he is, he's only there for a short time. You know, I mean, how long is he going to be in office for? Three to five years, and hopefully it'll pass over. I think you have to be very careful not to upset a gabba, you know. But on the other hand, you don't crawl to one. I mean, I've had good boy in my time. Thankfully, most of them have been okay. I used to have one, President Dom Shul, he used to say every week to me, no Khazanish, no Khazanish, no Khazanish. And it would shake with rage that if I sang any piece, but I ignored him because thankfully I had the support of the other wardens. I had another warden once saying, you know, he said he doesn't want me to sing any Khazanas anymore, but thankfully I said, no, I said, I'm only am singing Khazanas. I said, I only sing one piece, and I'm always going to sing that one piece. I just stood my ground. And thankfully, again, I had the support of the other wardens. I was still here to tell the tale, my God. But, you know, I don't think you should allow yourself to be kicked around. And, and at the same time, you have to remember that wardens are only there, you know, for a temporary period of time. And you have to stand the storm. But at the same time, you have to be dignified, you have to stick to what you believe in. I would never have a person say to me, no Khazanas. I mean, one shul in Manchester, I point to the Khazan on the proviso that he sings no Khazanas, and he took the job. On the proviso, he doesn't sing Khazanas. Now, I never would have I never would have the job. I never believe in, in singing Khazanas. If you Khaz shul will say to me, don't sing Khazanas, well, what, what spiritual satisfaction am I going to have in that congregation? So you have to abide your time. You have to use your hair. You have to use the circle. But you only can start with the warden and stand up to him if you know you've got support of other wardens. If you've got, if they're all against you, then you've got problems. But of course, you have to dive into a sham. They are to fill to say, you have to dive into a sham. And please God, all Khazanim should be successful. But one way right. of being successful is helping your other colleagues. You have to help your other colleagues and cannot just be interested in your own in your own uh, profession. If the congregation sees that you're helping other Khazanim, it looks good for you and it looks good for yours. As the Mishnah says in Ethics of Oz, it says, let your colleagues' honour be as dear as to your own. And that shows you're serious. It shows you're passionate. You're not just interested in your own, own career, but you're interested passionately in others as well. And I think a cousin has to go way beyond his call of duty. You know, you have to do other things as well. You have to go to shiver houses. You have to go houses you have to do other things you have to go to hosp visit hospitals even if it's not part of your duties not part of my duties go visit people but you know when i've been there so long and i know people in hospital i say to myself well i must go and visit him you know is he, whether it's my duties or not this is you know you know this, these people if you know them well you have to go so you have to go always beyond your job you always have to do more than what is actually written in your job and that way well um, you, you should be able to to stay in your job please god well uh, you said you said it, and uh, and that is, and I just want to mention. I'm going to ask you. Uh, we're going to open up for questions in a minute. Again, this is a very important book, and it is a, a guide for for a chazan, whether it be young or old, what to do, how to have a connection to the past, how to deal with rabbonim, how to deal with gaboyim. So many things you need to know. What to say, how to say, what to say, what to know, how mm. to have an appreciation for the past. And if you want the book, uh, Hazen Marks is out of stock at the moment. But if, you, if you're interested in ordering it, you have to email at him, Yehuda Marks, Y-E-H-U-D-A, Marks, M-A-R-X, 21 at gmail.com. 
and he will uh, uh, be in touch with you and uh, you can uh, speak with him, okay? Okay. I think thank you for that. Thank you very much, Haz and Marks, and I thank think you. we're going to open up the questions, I think. Okay. Yes, um, thank you very much. I think that your questioning, Nathan, has been excellent. And of course, Yehuda is so happy to talk to us about his passion and his love. And so I'm sure there are questions from um, uh, the floor, which is, if you'd like to raise your hand or make any comments, um, either raise your hand physically or the little hand. Um, I'd like to ask you, Yehuda, in yeah. the meantime, who, do you have children in your synagogue? Are there, who are you inspiring for the next generation of Chazanim? Um, in my synagogue, not. No, we don't. I have... I have sung with children in the past. I have inspired children. I've only sung with four, four children in my time in Edinburgh. Of those four, three came because on him. Not that I taught them, it didn't. But I certainly gave them a love of Kazonas and they developed their Kazonas further. Say, so I only teach Kazonas, I teach a bread and butter, but I actually encourage my students to go after the been to me to go to a top class cousin. So um, I've inspired, I'll say, four children have, sp have sung with me in my time. But it's an Anglican school. I've asked loads of people, I put things on cassette around the time. And today, most kids say it's not cool. They'd love to sing with me, but they don't think it looks cool to sing with a cousin. So I've left it at that. So I'm just wondering whether you have whether you have a solution. What do you think needs to happen or might happen or or how could it happen to change the situation? I think you need a cousin going into school, you know, as part of the curriculum and Jewish prayer, teaching them Jewish music, playing a few records and explaining what they're doing and see if they can recognize the different styles. And that could generate some interest. That's what I think you need to do out first. But my school's generally more middle aged to elderly. There's not that many kids there on Shabbos morning. We don't have that many kids, unfortunately. What about you, Nathan, in Stuttgart? Uh, how how who are you inspiring with your chazanet well i definitely inspire myself <laughs> no i'm only joking the 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 <laughs> um i don't know if i think in stuttgart it's a bit of a different story because we have the chazan along with the rov is more of a minister situation going on we have to do a lot of levias a lot of shiver houses a lot of uh, laning you know we've got a lane We've got to go to school less to inspire, but to teach uh, Jewish Yiddishkeit. We have to teach Yiddishkeit to the children. Um, the, the problem is, and that is what I've said to Hazem Marx, which I which I said to him a few weeks after. <laughs> I called him up and I said, why don't the people compliment me? Hazem Marx told me, you're in the job every week. You're davening every week. They're used to you told me of a very famous chazan, Moshe Sholof, uh, a lot of a Sholom. He davened every week. They didn't compliment him, maybe occasionally, but a chazan, if you're davening every week, it's very hard to necessarily to bring a chiddush along if you're davening every week. Um, but, some, you know, sometimes something gets into me and I give something, uh, whether it be the, the war that we just had and I sang a sim Sholom that I composed on the spot and people came up to me and they said that that moved me um but with children it's it's difficult well, i was a i was a very uh, i loved chazonus even as a young child and uh, i didn't ha i didn't have any i didn't want to be cool so i was uh, i went to chazan it didn't matter to me i wanted to be a chazan and i didn't care what anyone thought you know but i think it's it you do maybe find those children here and there but it, it's hard Thank you. Um, Alex, you wanted to um, come in. Uh, yes, thank you, Geraldine. Um, we haven't actually asked Yehuda what made you write the book and what was the end product you expected to get from the writing of this book? Was it meant for Chazonim? Was it meant for Gabotim and Rabonim? Or was it meant for the lay person to teach um, 
how and why the chazan or the camphor is is very important. So what motivated you? What was it? What did you think you would get out of it? Where's the book gone? And are you happy with what the outcome is? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I wrote the book really to be a manual for Chazolim because I was fed up of coming to the conventions and hearing Chazolim not stand on their feet. I'll give you an example. A well-known cousin in London, he got up and he gave a session and he said, Chazolim should be very careful what words they repeat. And he said, not only that, but you can't repeat, even, even in places where you can repeat, he said, if it's a biblical verse, you can't repeat it. Because by repeating a biblical verse like, he said, you're adding to the Torah. And this is clearly not true. A few weeks later, I went to her, this particular cousin, and he sang Talmuds of the Yom Shabbos, which repeats itself about 10 times. So I thought this is wrong. One cousin is doing one thing, saying one thing and singing and doing another thing. I thought we have to have a book which tells us where we can repeat, where not, how to stand up to rabbis because a lot of people come to conventions saying they get bullied by rabbis, I was hearing stories and the importance of song, we need to know how to stand up to Gaboyim and also a lot because on him, we're not helping their fellow colleagues. And I wrote all these things, all these were all chapters in my book and that's why I did. It's meant to be a manual book on him it's also meant to be there for rabbis and it's meant to be there for laymen as well you know to appreciate because on it's not one to be on him but to appreciate the Quran's to know where Hazan's coming from and the book as as hopefully will be in all soon in all the major Jewish libraries of the world which I hope to send them a copy a complimentary copy and those that want to buy quite a lot because on him have got it almost most of the world famous because on him have got copies and almost all that have been to conventions have got a copy I would say. Has it made any difference? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's going to take much more than my book to make it a difference. Much so more. how do we how do you think we teach the next generation and what difference can we of knowledge um help those that don't know in maybe bringing back the dignity and the need mm -hmm. for um all embracing cantorial music of the past the present and the future you know, it's not about old compositions and new compositions no it's not about it's more than that can you explain maybe to the to somebody who might not know well, uh, the problem is that prayer is no longer important as it was. One time a person went to shul, they went to hear the sobbing and the crying of the chazan, and they could empathize with that. Nowadays, people don't want to come to shul to pray. They want to come for a party. The most successful shuls now are ones that have a kiddish drawing the dufflings that break the dufflings apart and they go I had a man from my shul a former member of my synagogue and he lives in Winefield I asked him how is he getting on he told me oh he doesn't go to the main synagogue in Winefield he goes to Lubavitch I said what's an English person like you going to Lubavitch for he said I'll tell you why I go he said because it starts about 10 after 10 o'clock and they break up the service and when at any point of the service I can walk out and have a cup of coffee and that's what people want. They want a social more than a religious experience. They want to stand and schmooze. And in America, I read, there is even talk of some people wanting to do away with the structured service completely, <laughs> that the, the service was composed by the Andrew Knesset Kodola. They can no longer relate to a chakras, a mosav, and their idea of prayer is just to sit around a table, meditate a bit, and talk what experiences they had during the week, and then somebody will start and mention the prayer. So it's a formality of prayer that people don't want anymore. They don't want a formal setting of prayer <laughs> and people don't realize the necessity of praying to God anymore, which is very sad. But on the other hand, we have produced some brilliant Kazan in this generation. We don't have poverty and pogroms anymore. That's why people can't dab them with their, ex with their sobbing and with the Kavana of Kazan of the Olds. But nevertheless, this generation, without its poverty, without its pogroms, we produced a Motti Boyer who almost is identical to Rosenblatt. And for a generation to produce shows like Chazan, who's almost as good as Rosenblatt, is something. So there is hope there. There are some very good Chazanim out there, Pomerantz, uh, Lemma, and some brilliant Chazanim out uh, Nathan, and some brilliant Chazanim out there, and that shows there will, is, there will be a future, and there will be a future for Chazanim. But it's, if there's uh, no jobs for them, you heard uh, that. That's a big thing. They, that's um, at the moment. At the moment, because it's because People don't value the importance of prayer, but I think that will change. I think that will change. Can I, can I say one? Can I say one quick thing? Is that it's very important for me to yeah. say 
when I left the army, when I left the army, I was very nervous because you're leaving like when the Jews left Egypt, even though they were slaves, they had three meals or whatever they had a bit of protection. But it's the same. It's not the same. But when you leave the army, you're in it. You're in a you're, you're institutionalized. You don't have that protection anymore. And I called Hazen Marx and I said, what am I going to do? Where am I going to find a job as a Hazen? There's no jobs. He said, you'll get a job. Hashem will give you a job if, he, if, you, if you're good enough and Hashem thinks that you do, you'll get an... I got a full-time job. I think if you're good enough and you're really daven, Hashem is in charge of who gets the jobs, not us. And he'll give you a job if you, if you need it, if you're good enough. You have to be good enough. And I believe that many people that say, I want to be a Hazen, they simply don't know enough. They don't... They don't pre- like Hazen Marx was saying before, a real Hazen has to have an appreciation, has to love... He ha- you have to say to him, which chazonim do you like? And if he goes, you know, he'll go Ganchov. I love Ganchov. I love uh, Yisrael Alta. I love the uh, Cap of Kagan. That's a real chazan. He knows the, 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 the past and he, and he listens to chazonus. If he spends his day listening to Shweki and Avron Fries, his davening isn't going to be that good. Isn't it? And, and, and he'll never get a job because he doesn't, he doesn't have, he's not a real chazan. It's very, it's very, uh, chazan marks, when you listen to him daven, it's a real chazan. It's an it's an alter chazan. You hear he's a chazan, and that is that because he spends his time listening to chazonus. He doesn't spend his time listening to pop music, right? I think that's very simple. Thank you, uh, Neil, Neil Schwartz. You wanted to say something, can't you, Neil? Yes, thank you. So um, I have learned a lot, and Tudaraba for that. I made in the uh, in the chat th- the uh, fact that some of us are operating on a much more basic survival level. You're all familiar with Maslow's uh, pyramid of needs and the bottom need is um, you know food and stuff like that. Well most I apologize for having to come in late I had to attend a, another zoom which I also the nation has been like at the top four or five levels of a 10 level pyramid and the reality for those of us who are well trained and passionate about Nusach HaTfila here in America is we're much closer to the bottom we've got jobs but our congregants haven't got a clue about Nusach no matter how much we try to teach them what we're doing and why we're doing it I use my bulletin articles um, I use adult ed and Gordon is Um I've tried to do my part by teaching for our United Synagogue when they had a program, a, a boot camp, uh, to help with Nusach and, uh, and Laning. I've been on the faculty of Hebrew College online. I've done some coaching. And as I'm moving toward retirement in almost exactly a year from now, I'm hoping that I'll have an opportunity to do more coaching. But um, the one thing I want to reassure everybody is that at least that what I consider the more basic levels of the pyramid of needs, the schools here in America are doing a wonderful job of teaching Nusach HaTfila. And that's across the board, not just, you know, the, the big old schools like JTS and HUC, but the, the newer schools. Hebrew College, nobody gets out unless they know their Nusach cold and they have no problem getting into the Cantor's Assembly uh, qualifications. Um, Academy for Jewish Religion also. So um, I just want to express from the trenches, so to speak, even though I'm going to be technically leaving the trenches when I am close to 70 in a year, that we're not working at the level of whether or not people want to hear Chazanut. We're working at the level of being able and allowed to use the proper melodies for the Chatsi Kaddish, of which I had to learn 23 to get out of JTS, and I used 18 until I got to this current reform synagogue, I used 18 different melodies a year. And I'm not allowed to do that in this current synagogue. So, you know, some of us are really fighting in a much more basic battle. It's, it's very, it's very sad. It's very sad, you know, and it's the same with Lachadodi, with all the Lachadodis that there are for special occasions. It, you, 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 it's, it's sometimes very hard to sing. You know, I think it's to do with, you know, my predecessor, uh, I shouldn't say who it was, a certain chazan. Um, sang the regular Yigdal 
for on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, you know, and because he did that for 17 years, when I came along and I wanted to sing the right Yigdal, they said, no, 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 that's not the Nusuch, you're wrong, you know. So it, it's very, it's very terrible that a person who's educated in Nusuch like you, and you can't, you can't express it, it's very painful, I'm very sorry to hear that. Mm-hmm. Terrible. I'll daven for you. Um, uh, Paul Heller, you wanted to say to come in? Yes, um, thank you, Geraldine. And, and uh, Cantor uh, Nathan uh, and, and, and Cantor uh, Marx, I, I really learned a lot and, and I appreciate very much everything uh, you said. And I only want to make a little note of something Naftali Herstic told me in Prague uh, in the convention. And I, I think it's worth for all of us. He, he compared Ashkenazic, Western, and Eastern European with what he called Regesh and Seder. That's the difference between the two. That's and right. Me, as a Western European Hazan, I, I, I understand and I appreciate Eastern European Hazanut, which I cannot sing, but I, I really think that with Western European Hazanut, we can also achieve the same goals. Just that. Uh-huh. A hundred percent. In fact, it's very interesting. Oh, uh, do you mind no, if I you, say no. that? Yeah, yeah, you say it. Carry on. No, I, you know, when I came to Germany, um, the, the, you know, you have to know all the melodies for the slichas. There's all different melodies for the slichas and for the... It, it's very, very different because in England, you have both. You have the Western European melodies and then you have chazonas in between. But... I, I also would say Haz and Marx might not agree. We, we have different opinions. We're different people. So we have different opinions. Uh, mm. That you would say that Haz and Marx, I would say that you can necessarily do a davening full of German chazons and German nusuf, but Haz and Marx's uh, style is more to the Eastern European style. But I would say it's very, I think you can be a great Hazen. Uh, by, and there were in, in Manchester, Hazen Marx taught me that there was a Hazen, his name was, uh, who, who was it? In, in he had he, You have a picture of him on your porch. Newman, Harris Newman. Harris, Harris, Harris Newman. Newman. Harris Newman. Was Western, Western he, he was a Western Hazen. Everything he said, he didn't repeat words, but he was a Hazen. He still was a Hazen, but he just was a, a Western Hazen. And there's no, he's still a Hazen, but you're just not a, an Eastern European one, that's all. Hazen Marx, please. Uh, sorry. No, no, that's quite right. I don't know about him not repeating words, but he was in a Western style. I mean, even Western European does repeat words. Like Kovanokhiyama from Lewandowski does repeat a bit. There's less repetition in Western European. But it's a matter of taste. Again, I'm, as you say, I'm personally moved by East European, and I recognise that people are moved by West, even though some pieces of Western European move me a bit generally. I like the heart, I like the I like the crutch, I like the crack, I like the real, real heavy schmaltzy stuff. Okay. I, I think it's important not to sound like a chorister. Yeah, there are many on him that they, that they, that they it's important not to sound like a chorister. Once mm, you sound like you sound one of the choir one of one of the choir members, mm. then you have to start working on yourself because many on him they sing perfect. Perfect notation, perfect voice, mm-hmm. perfect, but they simply sound like a chorister. You have yeah. to still sound like a mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And my, uh, my, te- my teacher, Natalie Hurst, it was a master of both. He was, yes, he was yeah. a great, a great Eastern European cousin and a great, I don't, he's not here, but if he was here, I would tell him, but he, is, he was a master of both, a genius of both. I agree. I agree. And you are too. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not West. There <laughs> <laughs> are Marx. Marxist. <laughs> um I think that <clears throat> we've come to the conclusion that it's the Khazanim are great. Uh, there are many <laughs> wonderful young Khazanim, but it's the communities that that need to be hopefully educated to want somebody like that to intercede for them and to to uh, offer the prayers in in a way 
that's traditional. But of course, every synagogue, as you're finding, as Cantonil was saying, they're used to what, what they em emotionally respond to what their community is used to. And of course, a chazan has to be sensitive to that as well. But, but um, Neil also said, Geraldine, Neil also said the children are being taught in schools I was just going to, to appreciate say. that, where yeah. in our schools in the UK, we don't have that luxury. Not, it's not a luxury, we don't have it. If it is part of the curriculum in school, Jewish day schools in America, yeah. it's a great thing. Maybe it should be part of the curriculum in Jewish day schools well, in Europe and the United Kingdom. That might make all the difference. I was going to come to that to say that seems to be one of the solutions. Benny Meisner, you have your hand up, please unmute. Tell us. First of all, Nathan, it was very lovely to see you again. And uh, Mark's incredible. But my chance was last week. So I just wanted to say one thing that, um, um, one second. My rabbi, one of my many, many rabbis, the army of rabbis said to me, we have to bring some of the East into West European Chazonas and some of the dignity and the decorum of Western into the, into the East. Because as I told you last week that Eric Werner asked Israel Alto, how old were you when you sang this magnificent Sulza Lewandowski? He says, I was 21 years old. So, wow. um, and as, a, as my rabbi used to tell me, Benny belongs everywhere and nowhere I can relate to everything that was said in both sides because um, Chazanut HaRegesh can also infiltrate and mingle with Chazanut HaSeder. And so is Chazanut HaSeder supposed to be part and the ingredients of East European Chazanut. And on this subject, I have much to say down the future if I will be so privileged to do. But the session today was really remarkable and uh, uh, Yehuda, I read your book because you gave it to me as I put it in the chat. Um, it's really, so mentors are very important. So after I had all my mentors, many of you and many of the younger generations are also my mentors because when I lecture about the history of Shaliyah Tzibu from the seventh century, when he became a, a professional rather than a lay person leading the service, the role of the Chazan changed a hundred million times since then. But the basic mm -hmm. was it's Chazanut HaSeder or HaRegesh, the belt filler skill is the most important. Mm. And, and, and your, your uncle, Zichron Levrocha, was a master of both, wasn't he? Chazanut Yisrael Alton. Of course, it's so funny that I got a very traditional conservative job for the high holidays, and I'm sitting now studying Altos Nusach, which I never did because he was writing it when I was in living with me in his home. And he says, Kindleden, Kino Hell, can I go from this key to another key? Because he knew that I finished conservatory in harmony and theory. So <laughs> it's unbelievable. But I never studied all of it. I teach, of course, from, from Alpers and Katzkro and North Shoal and Sol Zim, everything. But but uh, yes, he, he, he knew the skills and he knew what needs to be expressed with each tenua in each vowel. One, one thing you said at the, at the convention, which was so funny, and I, and I think about it every... Now I think about it, every Rosh Chodesh venturing that I do, I think about what you said, that he, he was davening in, 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 in the shul and he was, and he, when it came to Parnosa, he gave real uh, regish chazonas and the Gabbai said, is there a problem with your salary? <laughs> it's brilliant, uh, it's so funny. He also, he also did, told me that when he sang the shul of in fact, in Shochen Ad in the morning, he sang in major. And I complained because in Philadelphia, I had to sing in major too. So I said, when you can sing in major, you can sing it too. But he told me that when he turned around and he saw the Hasidim and Shabbos uh, he gave them the schore like no, nobody else. Oh, interesting. And uh, Neil. Fascinating. Okay. I, I just wanted to clarify, um, Alex, with all due respect, you misquoted me. I did not say that day schools or any other Jewish schools are teaching Nusach. I said, actually rather proudly, having been on the faculty of one of them for a few years myself uh, in Boston, 
online, I said that all of the cantorial schools are teaching proper Nusach. Baruch Hashem for that. Alavai that we, any of us are allowed when, I mean, I haven't lived with anywhere near a day school in years, but um, my kids went to a day school and I was on that faculty and I taught a little bit of basic Nusach. But um, my, my main point is, this has been a fascinating discussion, but it's up in the, the ether um, all the more because so few Chazanim apparently are even working in the UK um, because the shuls don't hire them. Here in America, we're still being hired, but as um, for at least conservative, as opposed to both Orthodox and Reform, as Nusach specialists, because we, our congregants actually will listen to Nusach, and all those other clergy things. I'm a second clergy person, and for three times I've been the only clergy person. So if we're operating on a very, very different level of um, fighting for the continuation of this aspect of what it means to be a Jew who ever shows up in synagogue. That's what I was pointing out. Thank you. Um, sorry, I misquoted, sorry, I misquoted you. I, no, I also thought at first, but then realized you were talking about cantorial schools. But nevertheless, the idea that perhaps one day they could be taught in day schools is maybe part of a solution. Uh, David Praga. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. I think, Yehuda, that... Uh, for Chazanot to come back, it would require in the Orthodox community a leading rabbi or a leading Beth Din to make a pronouncement that the correct following of Nusach is obligatory and that the splintering of communities, you mentioned earlier on David Kosovitsky, he was in the Cathedral Synagogue of Hendon in the 1930s and the 1940s. Nowadays, in the Orthodox community of Hendon, the uh, rabbinic diktat al tifresh min al you shouldn't separate from the community, seems to have gone a little bit astray in that there are numerous new um, different minyonim that have the support of the rabbinate. So while, and therefore there's no large enough community, uh, large enough orthodox community that could afford a chazm, let alone want a chazm. So without some change in the rabbinic uh, instruction to its flock, I don't think it's going to be easy for Chazanut to come back. I'd just like your opinion on that. What's the chance yeah. of getting a positive statement from leading Bote Dinin and from leading Rabonin? Well, it's a very interesting, very interesting point, David. Um, be, if you would have asked me 20, 30 years ago, that would today the world famous Chazanut of today, oh, you never would have thought that. But I answered Chazanut's People told me it's a traitor profession. People knocked up a door, said, how could he go to Jewish college, Jewish college, where Louis Jacobs says, of course, it's not true. But that's what people thought. They thought it was a traitor profession. Now, all the world-class leading Chazon of the world are all Hasidim. It's kosher now. Sooner or later, attitude will so change. I think the steeple minyonim and all these little minyonim will disappear. And I think, I think it can come back. Hasidus is the biggest growing uh, movement in Judaism, and they look favorably now to Kazonis. I even know some Hasidic schools, even in London, where they bring over top Kazonim. Young Kileri, uh, uh, Marty Boy was brought over by a private minion in Golders Green. He didn't govern in the United Synagogue over Rosh Hashanah. He governed in a private minion of very from people, not the United Synagogue. So I think it's getting back, but it's taking time. It will take time. But remember, I always say it's in my book that Dinah Bromsky. He, was a, he used to preach in the Great Synagogue because the Great Synagogue in London was a seat of the chief rabbi, had no regular rabbi. So I never needed a sermon. Diana Bromsky is Rosh Basin. He spoke. And the chazan at the time was Simcha Kutsavitsky. And somebody asked Simcha Kutsavitsky, Diana Bromsky's son, how come your father allows Simcha Kutsavitsky to repeat? He seems to have always got on with him. And he answered, Diana Bromsky loved Kutsavitsky. He really loved Kutsavitsky. And he used to say that chazan it doesn't repeat his words, it's Nishta Chazan. And a rabbi that does repeat his words is Nishta Rav. And I've got that in writing, and if that's a help to any colleague, I can give them the article as an Amadeh newspaper. I've got the newspaper, and there you go. So a great authority like that, appreciate the Kuzanus. We just need to get our message out there. But the fact that all the younger generation of Kazanim are all Hasidim, like Pomerantz and uh, uh, 
uh, Yankee Lemma and Rosenfield. This is very good for Kazanus. This is very good. I think this will soon have a great effect on uh, on Kazanus worldwide. It, it's important for a chazan also to behave like a clergyman. It hmm. used to be that in England, in Germany now, Baruch Hashem, it's very it's very good because you have the chazan and the rov are nearly the same. You know, it, the chazan sits in the front of the shul with the rov. In England, I think it used to be like, oh, they sat on the bim or something. The chazan has to behave like a clergyman. And I think, I, I don't believe I'm going to say it, but that a chazan should lean. Because in a way, it's his way to show that he's, it's not the job of the chazan. I don't believe it belongs to the chazan, but it's a way to show that he is a clergyman. He is part of the clergy of the synagogue. And I think a lot of now people think a chazan, oh, he's not, he's not part of the clergy. He's just, he's just a chazan, oh, sing on you know, he's not taken seriously. And I think one of the ways maybe he can be taken seriously is that, like chazan Marx, he goes to shul, he goes to his, his minion every day. He, he's seen going to minion and he behaves like a clergyman. That is important. One of the things that I wanted to say about chazan Marx is that what we, what we can all learn is that he is a wonderful, um, you know, so he, he's wonderful to speak to. He's always got something to say. He uh, hasn't should be interested in his congregants and he should speak with them uh, in a nice way. And uh, he's very good at that, Hasan Mark. But that is something you have to learn. It's no good just saying, well, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get a BA in music. Very nice, very good. It's very important to have a high musical education. It's very important. But one of the most important thing is to be a clergyman, to, to be there for your congregants and to speak. And that is how you can you can be on the same level as the Rob. You know, you, it shouldn't just be the Rob is doing everything. You should do you should do stuff too. You know, it should be every Leviah. You should, if you can, I would say that you should, you should do weekday services in a way because, you know, it's not so, it's not so posh. I've been to many weekday services in the UK. It's a catastrophe. Nobody knows what they're doing Nusukh-wise in the UK when it comes to weekday davening. Nobody. I promise you. I've been to all of them. They don't know what they're doing. There's a difference between weekday davening and Shabbos davening, even for Pasuke de Zimra. There's a difference. But nobody knows it. And I think the Chazan should be there to do it properly. That's my opinion. It, it's all written uh, down. It is all written down, Nathan. The, the problem is that people don't realise it is much less expensive to have a full-time community chazan and community rabbi than it is to have a part-time chazan and other part-time workers who, if you add up the, the wages that they take, and they're all doing part-time jobs, so there's no continuity. In actual fact, if you want a job done well, like the old, that's why in the old days with the United Synagogue, Full-time chazan, full-time rabbi, or ministers, and they both and they both shared the communal duties. One maybe do more musical than the other, teaching bar mitzvah, bus mitzvah, laning, choir, music, cheder, it's and, and visiting the sick, going to the hospital, shiver houses, weddings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If the chazan maybe you know just been giving it over thought. If the cousin said, I want a, you know, a full-time job, and what we'll do is one, maybe like the old um, Sarota used to do it, um, a fundraising concert for per year as part of his contract where they would raise their salaries for the, for the year by people coming in to hear this first-class cousin. But by the same token, if you look at the Hamptons and the Tunnel Hurst and his choir, look how many... Um, tens and tens and tens of thousands of people tune in to public broadca broadcasting television to listen to that type of service, much more than any other service that is put on Zoom. So that must actually tell you something. It's not my figures, it's the figures that speak for themselves. PBS television will, will tell you the same thing. More than the Central, more than Dan Mutlu, more than um, uh, Azzy Schwartz, you know, more people tune in to Natanel Hurstig and Heimhoff's choir than they do to um, to any other uh, Zoom um, service. So that must tell, you, must tell you something. So, you know, it's education, education, and education. Um, okay. In Canada, okay. Zella yeah. Meyer is full-time. Is full 
uh, uh, Benny uh, Meisner, our dear friend, was full time, um, and the various other chazanim, and they all Eric Moses, they all did community work, and that's why they yeah. are. They, you know, they have a budget yeah. to use. They're given something to spend, and they have to use it wisely. Once that budget's gone, it's gone. So it's all community, and they are loved by their communities. And you can see it in the lectures, you can see it in the talks, you can see it everywhere. That maybe is the role model to look at. Maybe Canada is the role model to look at, and we can learn so much from what is happening in Canada, and, you know, they can help us. Absolutely. That's, that's hmm. quite right. But now the point is we have to see how we can be, everybody here, the catalyst for change. We have to perhaps show um, the people in charge of synagogues, the people in charge of synagogue bodies, that if they, if they want this thing, if it means something to them, if they don't stand up and catch it, it will be flown away by neglect. So I think that the, the most important thing we can do is show what it is. We had Michael Goldstein, who is the president of the United Synagogue, talking on the ECA's Voice of the Cantor, saying he's been so moved by cantorial music during this lockdown. It's meant so much to him and to so many of his colleagues. Now, we need to show him this is what you have got. This is what you could have. There are people still teaching it. There are people still willing to go into it. But if you're not willing to employ them, you will lose it by default and by neglect. So let's join ECA in being the catalyst for change by holding it up and saying, if you don't want to lose it, what are you going to do about it? And as one of the things we have found, as Alex has said, is to, con to consider employing a communal chazan who is part of the community, who is known by the community, who sees them through from birth to death, and to teach their children in the schools about what this music is, because if they don't have an emotional connection to it, it's going to mean nothing, as it probably does. So I wonder whether we should leave that as the last moment of something to think about as we go about our daily work and to thank um, Yehuda and uh, Nathan so much for bringing us their passion and their experience. They are there at the cutting edge. They are doing it. They are uh, receiving the acclaim, hopefully, and the respect of their communities, and they have got much to lead us. And so thank you so much. Thank you, Alex, for bringing them in and um, uh, suggesting this session. And um, the next section of the Voice of the Cantor is looking at the new oh. Europe. I think that, um, Nathan, you're going to be on the next Voice of the Cantor series. We're looking at the new Europe. What is happening in Europe where after the Holocaust and the communities were decimated, how are they building themselves up again? And that's Wednesday the 23rd at 7 o'clock. And um, if you look on the ECA website, you'll see that. And the next COS session on Tuesday, um, if somebody can remind me what it is, I'll try and, and, and have a look. Uh, uh, quite soon, we're going to have Julian Dawes talking to uh, Malcolm Miller about his compositions. Julian's been here today. Oh, there you are, Julian. Is it next it's week? Or, week. Eh? Next week. Next week. So we look forward to Julian Dawes talking to Malcolm Miller about Julian's amazing array of Jewish compositions in the classical music field. Do you want to just say a couple of words, Julian? We're going to, we're going to uh, look at a, a lot of my music um, 
uh, how it came to be, uh, my influences, uh, and some talk about procedural composition procedures. We'll cover a wide range of things. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to that. So that's on COS next week. And on the voice of the cantor, we have the new Europe. So thank you very much for joining us. Can today. I also mention something before we go? Spencer does a series in Edgware which promotes cantorial music. And his next um, part of the series about the, because Wembley has just announced they are closing their shawl and moving into a, a house. So, um, Spencer is going to take the programme himself and talk about the Chazonim of Wembley um, later on this month, which is a, will be a fascinating talk for us Brits and some of the um, people who don't know the Chazonim that were part of Wembley. Maybe Spencer would like, while we're online, to say a couple of words about this. Um, yes, I think it would be it's very least, nice. It's next, it's next Tuesday at 8 p.m., uh, British time, and um, you'll find the poster on the HWA United Synagogue. Um, I think it will be put up uh, today or tomorrow on the HWA United Synagogue website, um, and it has the International Times on it. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the six Chazanim who served the community over a 92, 93 year period, and I shall be playing a, um, a, a variety of music, choral music. You'll hear a boy chorister. Uh, um, a boy soprano, uh, there's even a hooper there. So you'll have a big range there, and I hope everyone enjoys it. But you'll see what a thriving shawl was like um, 25, 30 years ago uh, when we employed a full time rabbi and a full time cousin. Um, sadly, now um, the shawl is uh, downsizing and moving into a, a house. But um, might I say that my own shawl is one of the few that still has a, a part time cousin. Uh, who is uh, properly trained and our community do know the Nusach and they and, and they appreciate all, all, all the um, all, all the governing that um, Yossi Schwartz does and last week he did Rosenblatt Suvanucha Yoma. Thank you Spencer and um, if you would like to email me the details I can send it to all the people on this uh, list. I actually sent it to you earlier well, well, which email yeah. should I send it to? Uh, yeah, just to me, and I'll, I'll find it. You've sent it to me already. So okay. thank you very much, and I'm now going to say goodbye, and thank you again, and close the session for today. Can I say a quick thank you to Spencer? So thank you to Spencer. Oh, yeah, it's finished. Yeah, can I th quick thank you to Spencer for the, for the amazing videos. I learned so much from the videos that you put on there. They were really interesting. Thank you very, very much. Yes, we, we have an Edgeware United Synagogue YouTube channel, and we yes. have um, five of the sessions that Jeffrey Schuster has done there. Yeah, they, and, were, they were wonderful. And, and if anyone wants the links, I can send it to them, uh, spencer.nathan at uh, outlook.com. And um, Robert Brody will be doing one on his favourite Yummy No Rhyme recordings at the end of August, so look out for that. And from October, I'm going to have a monthly uh, Hazanut session uh, with Jeffrey Schuster and the European Cantors Association and others, but we'll have one every month. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'll try and let everybody know about these sessions. Mm -hmm. The main thing is to connect, connect everybody together. So thank you to Yehuda, to Melanie, mm -hmm. to thank Nathan, you. Alex, You're welcome. Lara, Laurie, and to uh, um, Mark and uh, see you.